So uh, my name's Gareth Jones. I'm the Clinical Coding Improvement Program Manager at Manchester Foundation Trust. Um, I've been in clinical coding for 18 years now, and whilst I've worked my way up from something called a clinical coding assistant, which was literally bringing and fetching case notes to and from officers, um, I've worked through being a frontline coder into a coding auditor, and then um, I'm currently in the position of coding improvement program manager, which basically entails me driving all the engagement within my organization to try and show people what clinical coding data can be used for, how they can facilitate good comprehensive clinical coding, um, and ultimately just retain a really high profile and a high level of education around structured clinical data and the value that it can bring. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us today and to uh, provide us with a bit of a talk on clinical coding. Uh, one of my colleagues is just in the process now of uploading your slides to share them with everybody. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it won't take too much longer. Uh, there we are. There um, we go. Excellent. Maximise that for Sheridan. Please. Um, there we are. The tune I guess. I'm going to drop out, and um, Sheridan's going to moderate the rest of the session. So, uh, if there are any issues, I'm sure we'll get them sorted. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, um, I'm pretty much here to talk about clinical coding in the NHS, specifically in the main around secondary care. But I can speak to to a, a fair degree of accuracy about primary care clinical coding as well. Um, Sheridan, could you just uh, go on to the next slide, please? Yeah, so um, thank you all for your patience, first of all, and I can assure you I will try and get the boring bits of the slide deck out of the way early on. And this is pretty much the definition of the boring bit. So clinical coding is the translation of medical terminology as written by the clinician to describe a patient's complaint, diagnosis or treatment or reason for seeking medical attention into a coded format, which is nationally and internationally recognised. Now, that's a very, what I refer to as a Ron Seal description. It is exactly what clinical coding is. But what I'm hoping to, to try and do over the course of this slide deck is what clinical coding is used for and so valuable and, and why it's such an interesting job to do. So, Sheridan, could you just move on to the next slide, please? So, in the vast majority of acute sector organizations this same process will be followed to actually carry out clinical coding a coder will review the patient's documented care record now depending on which organization you're working in they, that may be a full epr an electronic patient record record that's fully featured and it contains every bit of documentation um, in a lot of other organizations you're going to have a hybrid record which is part epr and part physical case record in some organizations, you may have just simply the case record, the physical case record. Across all of those organizations, the coding process, however, is still the same. A coder needs to review each and every bit of clinical documentation from uh, an admitted patient care spell and ultimately draw out the information that's required from that documentation. Uh, next slide, please, Sheridan. in the uh, World Health Organization document and the OPCS 4.9 procedure classification, which is an NHS digital document. Each of those, every single clinical code that you can possibly apply um, to any admitted patient care um, at this point in time in 2020. There are revisions to those classifications, but ultimately those are the ones that we're currently utilizing at the moment. Next slide, please, Sheridan. And the final part of it is having utilized the clinical documentation, having reviewed the terminology that's documented, the care that's been carried out, 
utilizing the classifications to actually codify the descriptions of the diagnoses and the procedures the point of actually entering them goes into whichever organizations it is patient administration system that information goes through that path system and is then ultimately passed through to any number of different secondary users who might need to utilize that information the next slide that i'm moving on to will tell you a little bit about what those uses are so there are a multiplicity of different uses for clinical coding, but the three main ones I'm going to talk about are epidemiology, funding and service planning. Ultimately, coded data sits in the centre of all of those. And if all those things are done effectively with effective clinically coded data, what it should result in is giving organisations the best possible chance they've got of actually being able to deliver safe patient care. You cannot do that if you're not appropriately funded. You cannot do that if you've not planned your services effectively. And ultimately, the underlying epidemiology of your patients is the path to be able to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Sheridan. Uh, next slide again. So epidemiology is pretty much a measure of um a population's health it, it tells you the actual full detail of your population's health and one of the things that we look at in particular in epidemiology is burden of disease now coded data sits within that in being able to be very very specific and actually allowing you to do that across both national regions but actually across international areas as well the benefit of utilizing a world health organization document like the ICD-10 is that it allows you to measure clinical coding from one country to another. So that coded data is utilized by a number of secondary users to do that. It can be used by people in NHS England and NHSI to look at what different types of disease are currently affecting our population in a given country or in a given, in a given region. And what it allows you to do then is to say, OK, from a public health perspective, what are, our, what are our biggest challenges that we've got right now? So it may be that we often read about um, an obesity epidemic that we've got within this country. Well, clinically coded data can help inform just what the size of that epidemic is. How many times does it have an effect on a patient's care? Does it mean that those patients who are obese are more likely to be in hospital? And what sort of conditions are they being treated for? Whilst their obesity might be part of their care, it's likely to be something like diabetes or it might be heart disease. It might be cardiovascular disease. Any number of different things that can um, come about because of, of, of poor weight management in some instances or, or, or familial issues that, that create that obesity means that the, that coded data can start to tell you a story about what the burden of disease is for any any number of different conditions that that may be affecting a particular patient or a particular population. Now, in increasing numbers, local authorities are utilising that health data to plan their social care services. We're trying to do more and more, especially in Manchester, is linking up our hospitals to our social care sector to try and ensure that care can be delivered in the inpatient's home where it's appropriate, or actually we can equip those patients themselves to manage their own health a lot better than it currently is. Ultimately trying to shift that burden of care from the secondary sector to a primary care or hopefully into the patient's own hands to, to be able to manage their, their health better in the first instance. Now, a very topical example of, of how coded data is being used in an epidemiological way and in a very direct way is during the current pandemic um, with COVID-19, there will have been probably coming to, to everybody's eye line the talk of this shielding list. We've heard an awful lot about patients who are having to shield due to their particular range of clinical diagnoses that put them more at risk of being ill once they've contracted COVID-19. The main method for capturing that list of patients is by using clinically 
coded data. NHS E and NHSI have basically pulled together a specified list of ICD and OPCS codes and any patient who's had any of those codes applied within the last five years is considered to have one of those risk factors. Those codes can be utilised across the country to get that list of one point, I think it's 1.2 million patients who meet one or more of those shielding criteria. That can be used across secondary and primary care. There are different codes utilised in primary care, but again, they are nationally defined. So the analysis can be carried out to ensure that we're capturing patients who've never been into secondary care, um, as well as those who've actually been admitted to hospital at some point during their lifetime. Coded data then can show for COVID patients what the outcomes for those patients are. Are the outcomes affected by which comorbidities they've got? Are those outcomes affected by whether they've had any surgical procedures carried out or not? Does that patient's care suffer if if they've got COVID? Does it does it cause condition better when a patient is admitted with COVID because those underlying conditions are managed to. There's any number of different scenarios that can potentially happen, but coded data can tell you the story of any of those different scenarios. Uh, next, next slide, please, Sheridan. And next slide again. So ultimately, uh, the thing that a lots of coders will tell you that they don't like about coding um, is that it is linked to the national payment framework. However, it is the case that for many, many years, clinical coding has been utilized in this way. Coding is the single best way to measure the types of events that have happened to a patient during any particular admission and what those outcomes of that care are. Um, can you just press for the next slide, Sheridan, please? So, the underlying payment framework for the NHS, or the vast majority of the NHS um, at the moment, is something called payment by results. Um, it attempts to do exactly what it says on the tin. It, it attempts to say, OK, the results of the care that you've delivered will drive ultimately the tariff that you achieve or the care that you have carried out. There are a number of different things that can affect that, but the unit of currency within payment by results is something called a HRG, a healthcare resource group. The method by which you utilize coded data to take you to a HRG is through coding, and you enter that coding into the patient administration system, and then it goes onwards through what is known as a HRG grouper. For the purposes um, of mischief, frankly, I'm going to present that as a big old sausage machine for, for this slide, because ultimately that is how the grouper acts. It takes in a number of ingredients, is captured on a patient administration system, and then ultimately through processing it through that sophisticated algorithm, or in this instance, a big old sausage machine, what you get out the other end is a HRG, a healthcare resource group, and there will be a tariff attached to that. So the first two things that affect the funding for a patient and the HRG that they ultimately receive is the patient's admission method and the length of stay. If a patient's a non-elective admission, it's highly likely it'll be more expensive to treat that patient and therefore more often than not, the tariff that you achieve is that much higher for a non-elective patient. Length of stay, same again, You, as you would expect, the longer a patient is in hospital, the greater the cost to the provider for delivering that care. However, the tariff can clearly not reflect that full length of stay because if it did, it would incentivize you to actually increase a patient's length of stay. And that's absolutely not the direction of travel that we want to go towards. In terms of the next factors, um, can you just uh, press onto the next slide, please, Sheridan? There are primary diagnosis, comorbidities, and procedures. Those are the things that clinical coding actually feed into. The primary diagnosis is the main condition treated or investigated. The comorbidities 
uh, any underlying conditions that are affecting the patient's care, and procedures are just exactly that. Any theatre procedure or any uh, any investigations that have taken place can be coded by the clinical coder. Once that information has been entered into the patient administration system, it pushes then through that sophisticated algorithm that decides what all those factors actually mean and which HRG group is most appropriate. And then out the other end comes that sausage that is that HRG. Uh, next slide, please. And that is attached to a national tariff, which uh, then hopefully that tariff should allow you to run safe and sustainable clinical services. Next slide, please. Sorry, can I just ask in the chat, somebody's mentioned that there, there doesn't seem to be any audio. Can, can anybody else confirm if, if the audio is coming through for them, please? Excellent. You two guys will do well enough for me. OK, so um, in essence, HRGs are set up as a method to try and say similar patients with a similar method of treatment and types of treatment will cost a similar amount of money to treat. So if you've got a patient who's got an ingrowing toenail, who's come in for a nail bed ablation, then say it may it cost you £450 as a provider to, to deliver that care. But if that same patient comes in and they've got a multiplicity of underlying conditions that are also adding to the cost of that care, it may be that the diabetic, it may be that they've got other issues that underlie that, that uh, ingrowing toenail that actually increases that patient's length of stay. It could be that there, there is input from occupational therapists, physios, dietitians, whatever it might be those other things may feed into a costlier length of stay for that patient. That is recognised in the HRG structure by creating what is known as a paired or a tiered HRG. In essence, what it deems to do, or what it attempts to do, is to say the cost of a simple, straightforward version of that ingrowing toenail patient isn't the same as a more complex one. And we're going to measure the complexity of that patient by the level of comorbidity that they've actually got clinically coded for them. And this is where comprehensive documentation by clinicians is really very important. Now, whether that patient's been into hospital once or 15 times every other week, basically what needs to happen is in each and every spell of care, a clinician needs to document both what the primary diagnosis and procedures are, but also what those underlying conditions are. Clinical coders are not allowed to assume that those long-term conditions continue to be relevant to each spell of care. That's a frustration for many clinicians, but unfortunately it's the coding um, guidance that we cannot assume those conditions to continue. Uh, next slide, please. So that's where we're at in terms of funding. It's a fairly high level overview of it, and I'm more than happy to take any questions uh, that may come along at the end. But in, in, in terms of trying to demonstrate how that actually affects service planning and how it can affect the way that we treat patients, um, I'm going to talk through a particular piece of work, a programme of work that's being carried out at Manchester Foundation at the moment that's been led by a vascular surgeon called Nazir Ahmad. Next slide, please. So the Manchester Amputation Reduction Strategy is, again, pretty much what it, what it says in the title. It is an attempt to reduce the total amount of um, amputations that we need to carry out for our patient population. And what we need to do to, in order to do that is to try and drive care and the delivery of care to the point of actually those patients in the first instance caring for themselves and ensuring that they are looking after their own health better. That, to, to that end, we, we're looking to reduce the, the overall number of um, amputations by around about 25%. You will see from the slide that the overall cost for Greater Manchester um, in 2015-2016, uh, sorry, 2017-2018 was £200 million. 
and that's um, predicted to grow to 500 million pounds in 2021-22. Clearly, this is a large group of patients. The economic impact of patients needing to have an amputation is that clearly they cannot work anymore and there's an economic impact to it. But as well as the economic impact that's there and, and, and those figures speak for themselves, there's clearly a quality of life impact for those patients. It is a life changing event for you to have to take, have to have an amputation. Now, these are mainly lower limb amputations that we're talking about here. And the national challenge is equally a huge, huge undertaking that we need to try and uh, overcome. But in Greater Manchester, the health inequities and inequalities that are shown through the coded data show that actually in Greater Manchester, it's a, it's a very, very big challenge that we've got between inequities, between the patients who've got diabetes and have vascular issues versus those patients who don't have diabetes and have vascular issues. There is an assumption that the vast majority of lower limb um, amputation are carried out on patients who are diabetic. That's not necessarily true. Those patients who do have diabetes and vascular issues are actually managed better because most organisations carry out diabetic foot clinics. Not many organisations carry out foot clinics for patients who aren't diabetic. So right away there is an inequality in the way that those two groups of patients are treated. The, the differences in outcomes differ wildly between different racial um, ethnicities. There is a number of different factors that go into how well a patient does with a vascular um, condition and ultimately how they pro progress through that, that disease. Is it something that we get early on, manage them better so it, it, it elongates the amount of time that they can live um, comfortably without needing an amputation um, and that will be largely due to how well they manage themselves but also how quickly they can get into the hospital system and the primary care system in order to manage those vascular conditions. Next slide please. So that's where we're at in terms of what the challenge is. But what is the role of clinical, clinically coded data within that? Well, coded data allowed us to cross map primary care codes and secondary and tertiary care codes. This is a full system approach that we're taking with, with the Manchester Amputation Reduction Strategy. It cannot simply be something that only secondary providers come together on. Capturing that information in primary care and being able to track that patient into their secondary care um, admissions is really important because what we can start to do is tell the full narrative of the full story of that patient. At which point in time could there have been earlier intervention? Are there, are there tricks or chances that we're missing earlier on in that patient's care that would have precluded them ever needing to come to a hospital and unfortunately going on to have an amputation? Can we then, utilising coded data, measure the success of those interventions by care settings. What I mean by that is if we start carrying out some of the interventions that are only taking place in a secondary care setting at the moment in a hospital, if we move that to primary care, how do we measure the benefit or otherwise of doing that? The efficacy of moving where that care is actually carried out. Again, clinically coded data is the way to capture that. It's measuring the type of interventions that take place and ultimately it's measuring what the outcomes are for those patients. So as you can see, when we work in a, a healthcare sector that spans multiple different um, levels, whether it's primary care, secondary care, whether it's GPs, whether it's um, tissue viability nurses that work in the community, whether it's a vascular surgeon who's ultimately the end point of that patient's path of care, each of those different elements of that patient's care need to be able to tell one continuous full narrative for us to understand what that patient's overall story is. And that's where coded data comes in. Next slide, please. 
Another instance of how we utilize coded data uh, in Manchester is a piece of work that we did probably five years ago now, which was very much driven uh, in terms of how we were operating within the hospital, within Manchester Foundation Trust. And there was a recognition that there was a concern that we were having an awful lot of blood wastage. Quite simply, we were taking too much blood out of the blood stock for patients who ultimately didn't end up needing that blood. And as you cannot return that to the blood stock at that point in time, we needed to approach it in a way that actually made us work in a way that was a little bit more intelligent about how we actually decided how much blood to take out of the stock in the first instance. Next slide, please. So utilizing an awful lot of different types of data of which co clinically coded data was what, just one element, what we worked our way toward was to say, okay, the vast majority of blood usage is for patients who've had surgery of one type or That blood is not simply taken out of the blood stock just at the point that it's needed. Clearly that blood needs to be put into theater or made available within theater on the office that it might actually be needed. How do we plan to do Well, we look at what procedures have been listed on a particular theater list and then we say, OK, for these types of procedures, we on average use three units of blood for these patients. Except the logic that was utilised to do that was quite outdated. And actually, it could start to have been affected by specific surgeons saying, actually, for my theatre list, I want a minimum amount of blood available on hand. And ultimately what it led to was a lack of standardization, which meant that there was an awful lot of blood being wasted. So through being more, inte more intelligent and looking at actual usage as opposed to blood ordering and blood stock, what we were able to look at was when a patient's had certain types of procedures as defined by clinical coding, utilizing and triangulating the blood usage data against those particular patients, how much blood was and what we found is that in many, many instances, blood was being ordered and, and in far greater than was ever actually needed um, in, in the unfortunate instance that those patients actually had a complication within theatre. We were able to reduce the overall blood usage so significantly that actually we reduced the blood uh, blood stock bill that we were we were paying by £250,000 per year. That's always something that's going to please any particular trust. We want to be working as efficiently as possible. But what I would say is that given the time at which this happened, what it helped to do is to secure a more resilient blood stock. This happened, this piece of work happened before the bombing that happened when a no, vast number of patients from that incident actually had to come to Manchester Foundation Trust. The fact that we'd been able to create greater resilience within our blood stock by being more intelligent about the way that we utilised it meant that we could treat those patients effectively and we didn't come close to having any issues with our blood stock. So yes, there is a financial efficiency to it. Yes, there is a benefit to it in a way that is most efficient and most economic, but actually the underlying patient experience and the, and the patient safety benefit is that we were able to have a very resilient blood stock that allowed us to treat those patients. Next slide, please. So pretty much as I've gone over there, the role of the clinically coded data point uh, in that instance um, was that we were able to look at which procedures took place, what amount of blood usage actually took place for those, and we were able to be more intelligent about the way that we ordered that blood in the first instance. Next slide, please. So clinical coding as a career option. Um, what roles 
are there within it? Is it simply that you will only ever do the same thing if you become a clinical coder? Is there a career progression pathway available? Well, yes, there is, and different organizations will have different varieties of these roles, but this tends to be the breadth of the roles that are available within clinical coding. We've got the frontline clinical coders. The, the way that the vast majority of people get into a coding career is through this pathway. As a frontline clinical coder, you are the one who will be analyzing the documentation, the clinical documentation, and entering the coded data at source. There is a recognized professional qualification. It's a national clinical coding qualification. And on average, we look to hopefully have new coders, new to the profession, looking to undertake that qualification within 18 months to two years of starting in the profession. It's two exams, a practical and a theory, three hours each, carried out on the same day. It aims to understand just how well you can carry out your job through your knowledge of the clinical coding classifications that ICD-10 and the OPCS4 that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. It looks to try and uh, demonstrate what your anatomy and physiology knowledge is, what your medical terminology knowledge is. So I would like to think that those of you who are attending this session probably have a good starting point in terms of both of those particular factors and both those criteria that any recruiting organization would look to when recruiting somebody brand new to a clinical coding pathway. Obviously, through that clinical coding pathway, there are different levels of seniority. Most organizations start, patient, uh, start coders as a trainee coder. You will, generally speaking, be given um, in-house training. You may potentially be sent um, externally to go onto your mandatory training course, which is known as the standards training course. It's a 21 day um, classroom based training that ultimately looks to equip you with uh, a very good knowledge of how to utilize the classifications in order to interpret and the care that you're, you're, you're reading in those case notes on a daily basis. At that point in time, if you pass the National Clinical Coding Qualification, more often than not, most organisations will, um, will reward that by creating a senior, senior, uh, a senior clinical coder post that you will then be able to, to apply to. Generally speaking, that does come along with a, a pay increase, as you would expect. Then that starts ultimately the path onto those uh, those higher up the structure kind of clinical coding roles, which I'm going to go on to now. The main one that I'm going to speak about next is coding training. Ultimately, those clinical coders who come new into the industry need someone to be able to teach them how to do the job in the first place. Unsurprisingly, that's what the coding trainer does. The coding trainers themselves have got a further professional qualification that they have to undertake in order to to be classified by NHS Digital as a clinical coding trainer. They need to have been at least three years um, as an accredited clinical coder, which they'll achieve by passing that national clinical coding qualification. And they need to go through a trainer assessment day, which seeks to have them demonstrate that as well as have a significant and deep understanding of clinical coding and their clinical coding standards and the classifications, they need to be able to demonstrate that they can actually articulate that in a way that means that coders can learn to do the job in the first instance. We're very lucky at Manchester Foundation Trust in that we've got one clinical coding tra trainer on site who is somebody who's been in clinical coding for 20 plus years and actually has been one of the people who's created a lot of the learning material that is used nationally. Alongside those coding trainers, there generally in most organizations sits a coding audit function. So if you're going to be a coding auditor, you're going to provide what auditors do in most industry you're going to provide quality assurance. You're going to make sure that the data that's being captured is actually accurate and it's you and it's fit for purpose. As a coding auditor, what that will mean is you will pick up whatever that source document that that, that coder has utilized to carry out that coding in the first instance, 
and you will seek to demonstrate whether that coder has applied codes accurately against what is documented in the case record. What you cannot do as a coding auditor, and where my role comes in in coding improvement, is you cannot say what the clinician has documented is actually what happened to that patient during that spell of care. A coding, audit, a coding auditor will only ever measure the accuracy of coding against what is documented. It's very important that we can assure ourselves that our coders are fully equipped in order to capture that information and translate it accurately where that documentation is correct. But where that documentation isn't correct, that's where the coding improvement team come in. So in coding improvement, ultimately what my role and what the role of my staff is to try and do is to ensure that there's a high profile profile understanding of coded data and that leads into better documentation by having people understand just exactly what it is that the users of coded data are what benefit is there to a clinician for them to document appropriately in the first instance Presentations like this that I'm giving now are something that I do on an almost weekly basis in-house in, in Manchester Foundation Trust. I also present this sort of presentation um, as part of the NHS Future Focus, Focus Finance Programme that's running nationally. Again, there's a recognition by the finance teams in each and every hospital and the hierarchy in each organisation that clinical coding is at the core of how organizations are financially recompensed for the care that they deliver what we try and do in coding improvement is engage to understand throughout any given organization what the current challenges are we can't simply keep banging on about why coded data is wonderful and useful without actually making a connection to what is a current challenge for a particular specialty or a particular organization only through engaging with people can you understand what those challenges are and if um, there is a benefit that can be brought by clinical coding. Creating a greater understanding of what coded data is and what it can do ultimately will mean that people in the wider organisation understand that there is a value to them and linking in with their clinical coding improvement team and their clinical coding team uh, at large to fully capture every piece of care that they carry out but also to understand that the data that is at their fingertips what it tells them about their service what it tells them about their patient population and then to my mind the least uh, interesting part of it because i like talking to people is a coding manager and that ultimately is where you're ensuring your coding services meet trust requirements it is making sure operationally your coding department is doing everything that it needs to do to ensure that the organization is getting the service it needs it's ensuring that you're appropriately staffed it's ensuring that your coding trainers are training people at the point that they need to be trained it's ensuring that your coding auditors are providing that quality assurance not only internally to the coding department but also sharing that assurance uh, across the organization it's to ensure that your coding improvement team are going out and targeting the right areas to improve things in terms of documentation, in terms of utilization of system, clinical systems in that area to, to capture information more fully. And ultimately, it's to make sure that those clinical coders who are at the bottom part of that pyramid are fully equipped to do the work they do and are fully supported through their training, audit and improvement team. So you can see overall, there's a, there's a, there's a team uh, ethic that goes into the vast majority of clinical coding departments. Most organizations will have at least some of those coding roles. We're quite lucky in, in Manchester Foundation Trust that we've got each and every one of those roles. Um, I can see that there's been a question come up in the chat, which I'm just going to uh, uh, answer now if that's okay with everybody. Um, Monica, um, you're currently studying level two medical terminology and completing level two business administration. I'm looking for a trainee apprenticeship role in the Birmingham area. I was also looking at anatomy and physiology courses. If there are no trainee vacancies opportunities, do you think it would help for me to email local department? Well, as somebody who's done an awful lot of interviews, I can categorically tell you, Monica, that those things that you're undertaking at this point in time 
will absolutely be a tick in the box for what most organizations would be looking for. When I'm interviewing people, what I look to, to have them demonstrate to me is that they've got an interest in the actual role and the organization that they're going to go and work for. So absolutely, I would suggest asking local departments if you can go on and shadow um, a member of their coding team will always be a benefit to you. It'll show you not only what the theory of coding is that, that, that I'm sure you've got a lot of that knowledge already, but it'll show you in that organization how the actual work is carried out. So yes, Monica, I would absolutely suggest that is a, a, a very definite positive thing that you, you could do. Um, equally, I'll be sharing my contact details at the end of this session. I'm more than happy for you to contact me and we can arrange a phone call um, and I, I can I can talk you through uh, any questions that you, you, you may have. Um, I understand that there are you're in the Birmingham area. What I can say is there are a number of hospitals within the Birmingham area, so it's likely at some point or another they will be recruit, recruiting clinical coders. Um, okay, um, so next slide, please. So terminology. I keep banging on about this thing. It's the way that clinical coders actually, the, the, the grist to the mill, if you like, the actual ingredients that they need to filter through on an ongoing basis in order to capture the coded data. There's certain types of language that coders can use and can't use. Now, this is very frustrating to clinicians because it's largely semantic, the differences between them. But unfortunately, they, they, these are the coding standards that we need to stick to. So coders can utilize documentation where it says that there's a, def a definite or a definitive diagnosis, where that patient's being treated as a particular diagnosis, where it's a probable diagnosis, where it's presumed or where it's likely. Coders can't utilize any uh, the medical terminology when it's documented as a differential diagnosis, a possible, maybe suspected diagnosis, or the one that most junior doctors will pick me up on when I do this presentation is impression. The vast majority of medical training I'm led to believe is still the case that where you are not definitive as to what a diagnosis may be for a particular patient, document impression. Unfortunately, that's too vague for a clinical coder to be able to utilize. And the final one uh, on that section is anything with a question mark near it really. It creates a level of ambiguity that means that the documentation that comes after it isn't deemed to be accurate and definitive. Next slide, please. So another frustration for clinicians is this particular piece of information. Clinical coders are allowed to look at diagnostic test results, absolutely but we're not allowed to interpret what those test results are in a way where we apply a definitive diagnosis ourselves. So whilst a BMI of more than 25 is considered through um, the BMI, measure, uh, BMI measurements used across the country to be considered obese, unfortunately a clinical coder isn't allowed to code obesity just by virtue of the BMI measurement for that patient. A number of clinicians don't want to document obese in the instance that it might actually offend the patient. Ultimately, that what that means is no matter how large the obesity epidemic is deemed to be within this country, it's a fair, it's a fair bet that actually the level of obesity is under-recorded because more often than not, it's the BMI that's documented and not a statement of obese. Uh, there are other examples on there of where patients might have, have had their blood taken and they've got a deranged white cell count. More than likely than not, that will mean that they've got a viral infection, but it may not. It may be another cause. So simply a coder cannot pick up the fact that that patient's got a deranged white cell count and a cell code. KD happens chronic, but that is not to say coder can interpret them. So we need the clinicians to actually document the diagnosis that, that, that is apparent for each and every one of those tests. 
Now, the reason I'm walking you through this is our next slide is a case study. To shout out in the chat, please, if you can read that, um, if you can read through the discharge summary for that patient and just add conditions or any procedures that you feel should be captured for this particular patient. So I'll give you a couple of, couple of minutes to do that. And please, please just add them into the chat as you as you're going through, so that I can see that someone's actually going through the <laughs> actually going through the discharge summary. Okay, what I'll start to do is talk through that discharge summary and try and demonstrate why certain things can be coded and why they can't be coded. No, no problem, no problem, Leone. Um, so if I, I will read through the summary uh, if that will help anybody. So the patient was admitted following a fall onto the right knee after tripping over the dog in the garden. They'd had a previously complicated revision of, the, of, of a total knee replacement weeks ago. They sustained a proximal tibial excuse me, periprosthetic fracture around the knee replacement. The patient surgery, however, she developed high inflammatory markers and oozing. The patient was then transferred to, to a reconstruction team of a specialist orthopedic hospital for further surgery. Transfer was delayed due to UTI. The MSU showed E. coli treated with levoflaxin. Investigations oh, yeah, are carried out. Really sorry to interrupt you. I'm just coming into it. We've actually got to just wrap up this session uh, okay. in preparation of the next one that comes in. But um, our apologies that there are a few issues initially uh, technically. No and thank you again so much for uh, coming and speaking with us. Okay. Um, can I just your... can I just ask one final thing? Sorry, would you just press the next slide? I just want to demonstrate to, to those people who have, have actually worked their way through this discharge summary, which codes can be applied and which can't. So you can see there that there are a number of codes that can be applied. Monica, thank you for attempting to do that. What you can see is that on the discharge summary, that patient's got a BMI of 34 and a long-standing EGFR 45 to 49 those are test results that can't be coded and that's why they are not in that clinical coding that is captured there um can i just ask if you flick to the final slide my contact details are on there in case anybody wants to get a hold of me uh, there's a yeah thank you very much so apologies that i've overrun there i hope anybody who stuck around for the session um enjoyed it and if you've got any questions please do contact me on any of those contact details. Thank you very much. Once again, Gary, take care.